So this is much, much broader than the historical entrepreneur who lives in Silicon Valley. You know, they're raising VC money. Sure. Cetera, well, that's not, you know, it's funny because that's not the historical entrepreneur, right? Okay. They, that's, a, that's a more modern idea of a particular kind of entrepreneur, right? But the, 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 the concept of starting your own business and, and, and building something for yourself long predates mm -hmm. Silicon Valley. We're all about turning a crappy situation into something about positive. A quarter million dollars of credit card I debt. I still remember the day when no one turned out. Throw it in the garbage and start from scratch. I could give myself a chance, so I started something. I mean, I think that counts as from poop to gold. <laughs> this episode is brought to you by Divi. Welcome back to From Poop to Gold. I'm your co-host, Benton Crane, and CEO of Harmon Brothers. I'm coming at you from New York City. I'm at the headquarters of Entrepreneur Magazine with Jason Pfeiffer, the editor-in-chief. Welcome to the show, Jason. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Now. Tell us, what is an editor-in-chief for us non-journalist guys? It's a great question. I get it a lot, actually. And I've, I always have a hard time explaining it because an editor-in-chief does so many things. But to make it really simple, I oversee all editorial for our print, digital, other extensions. Uh -huh. If it's journalism-based, then it's something that is running in some way through me. And then I'm also the person who goes out and represents the brand. So I often think of myself as kind of face of brand. It's not, I don't own the company, but I am the person who's going out there to be the representative for entrepreneurs. Got it. Now, I want to dive into your journey and learn more about it. But before I do, let's talk a little bit about Entrepreneur Magazine. We've all seen it. Yeah. We all, you know, we've seen the shelf. We've read an article. Sure. Um, but tell us, what does the brand stand for? What is your mission? What are you guys going for? So when I took over at Entrepreneur Magazine in 2016, I came into a magazine that had largely been functioning like a magazine for small business people. It was a very specific definition of what entrepreneur means, which made sense, because this brand has been around for 41 years, and for most of that time, the word entrepreneur was very narrowly applied. Most people mm -hmm. didn't know what it meant. They certainly didn't know how to spell it. And the answer I came up with is that it's not any one kind of career path. It's not any one kind of person. It's just someone who makes things happen for themselves. And so that is what we target in this magazine. It's a magazine for people who want to achieve, who have a vision for themselves, and that can mean that they have a company that they built, it can mean they have a side hustle, it could mean that they're just thinking entrepreneurial inside of another organization. I want this to be a magazine about creative thinking and problem solving for anybody who wants it. So this is much, much broader than the historical entrepreneur who lives in Silicon Valley you know, they're raising VC money. Sure. Et cetera, well, that's et not, you know, it's funny because that's not the historical entrepreneur, right? Okay. They, that's, a, that's a more modern idea of a particular kind of entrepreneur, right? But the, 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 the concept of starting your own business and, and, and building something for yourself long predates mm -hmm. Silicon Valley and, and, and the current investor climate. No, I, I was very, very careful. I didn't want this to be a magazine that was just for people who identify as a tech person or who is going to build a company that's going to be a billion dollars. There are a lot of people who read this magazine who are running what are functionally lifestyle businesses, a business that's great and supports their lifestyle. And that's awesome. I want anybody who sets out and says, you know, I can make something of my own. I have a vision and I want to build this for me. That's someone who we want to talk to. And to me, the greatest achievement is not when I hear from someone in Silicon Valley who liked a story, though mm -hmm. I hear from those people and that's awesome. I actually prefer when somebody emails me and is like, hey, I'm a teacher and I was sitting at an auto body shop and I picked up this magazine and I didn't think that it was gonna be for me, but then I found all this stuff that actually was relevant to me and now I'm gonna subscribe. And I'm like, perfect, because that means that we've reached outside of that narrow definition right. to everyone else who can just embrace that mindset. Now, from my observation, sometimes it kind of feels like entrepreneurship has become like the new rock star, or yeah. the new athlete, mm -hmm. or the, you know, it, it, it's taken on kind of a celebrity status. What, yeah. In your perception, what's driving that? I think it's a couple things. So first of all, there are literal celebrities who now want to not want to associate with the concept of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's you know, we're, we're <laughs> it's easy for me to get 
folks on this cover, right? I mean, we're, we're sitting in front of a couple of magazine covers. We have Mark Wahlberg uh, on the cover right now, Sterling K. Brown before, Carly Kloss uh, before that, um, the, our last three issues. Now, these are people who have been on other covers or mm -hmm. requested to be on covers. And you know, they are often really excited to be on ours because we're gonna talk to them about this thing that is core to their identity, but that a lot of people don't talk to them about because people want to be thought of as entrepreneurs. Celebrities do. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's great. That's one level of visibility for us. What's driving at the bigger question that you're asking, which is why is the idea of the entrepreneur so valued in our culture right now? I go back to the recession. I think that around 2008, as companies were closing and people were getting laid off, I think everybody learned all at once, and especially the younger generation who was just coming up and watching this happen to their parents or their older siblings, learned nobody is taking care of you but you. Nobody. You can work at some company and maybe they'll take care of you for a little bit, but they are not, they are not there for you long term. It's not possible. That's not the economy we're in anymore. There's no more getting a job at some corporate place and then working there for 40 years. There is none of that. It's gone. So what do you do? Well, what you do is you go out and you think entrepreneurially and you build for yourself. And I think the people who did that, the Steve Jobses of the world, they established this direction, this ambition for a generation of people who felt like the only steady course was their own course. And I think that's why the idea of the entrepreneur has become such a rock star status because it, it means something. It's a symbol in our culture and the people who did it are the ones who rang the bell and everyone mm -hmm. else wants to follow. Yep. Let's go back to you, Jason. Sure. What was your journey like? How did you end up here at Entrepreneur, and how did you end up as Editor-in-Chief? Yeah, it's, it was a long winding journey, and I think is similar to what anybody else experiences, right? You, you can't set some goal at the very start of something and then go and just reach it. It like, doesn't work that way, and if you set yourself out to do that, you're gonna set yourself up for disappointment. I could have not told you that I would be running this magazine at the start. I couldn't have told you that this magazine existed at the start because mm -hmm. it wasn't on my radar. I started as a community newspaper reporter. The only thing that I knew was that I loved to write, I loved to talk to people, and, this, and, and something about it came natural to me. But what did I want to do with that? I didn't, didn't know. I mean, my first job was, I hated it. I hated my first job. It was in the, it was at this place called the Gardner News, 6,000 circulation at the time, who knows what it is now, daily newspaper in North Central Massachusetts, just covering nothing, because nothing was happening. And I really struggled there because it wasn't my environment. I didn't, I wasn't of this community. I wasn't invested in the community. I wasn't really invested in any community. I, I, I grew up in, I grew up in like a you know strip mall town in South mm -hmm. Florida, and I didn't care about that place any more than I cared about this place I was working in Massachusetts. And so I wanted something bigger, and I didn't exactly know what it was. I couldn't define it at the time, but I knew it wasn't what I was doing now. It was and a job, but no fulfillment in it. It was a job, but no fulfillment. But it, but even more frustrating was that it, it felt like I was at the starting point of a of a, a career path that could be fulfilling, but I had no idea how to get down that path. Um, and it felt like there was a lot of gravity where I was, right? Like just holding me down, mm -hmm. like the, to break out of that gravity, break out of that atmosphere and get to the national publications and the kinds of things that would be more exciting, very tough. And, uh, and most people at that starting point that I was at don't make it much further. And so I had, after a year of working at this paper, paper that I didn't care about, I had this epiphany and it was one that really helped carry me through the rest of my career. And it was this, nobody at the publications that I want to write for, so imagine me, I'm fresh out of college, I'm working in this dumpy little town, my dreams are a little abstract, but are basically like write for the New York Times, the Washington Post, or something like that. None of the people who work at the New York Times or the Washington Post, none of them, zero of them, are reading my work in the Gardner News. None of them. There is no chance that I'm going to get an email from the New York Times that says, hey, a story you did in the Gardner News was really great. You should come work for the New York Times. It's literally never going to happen. So I can't sit around and wait for them to come to me. I have to go to them. It's that simple. So I quit my job. 
And I sat in my bedroom in this tiny town, Massachusetts. And I... Was that a scary decision or was that more like a... It wasn't like an exciting decision. It was an exciting decision. The stakes were low. I was young. I was living in an apartment that cost me two hundred fifty dollars mm -hmm. a month because I was living with some friends, um, and I felt like you know I know exactly what the trajectory is if I stay. I know what it is because I've seen it and I've met those people. I could stay at that tiny paper for a couple more years, move up to a slightly larger paper, and then a slightly larger paper, and maybe by the time I'm 45 years old, I get a job at the Boston Globe. I don't want that. So yeah, it was it was scary. Sure, any change is kind of scary, but like scary in relation to what? In relation to this thing that sucks for me, right? I mean, and I should I just stress like this is a fine career path for many people. It just wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. I didn't want that. I'm not a community newspaper. It doesn't excite me, and so. Um, so, you know, I mean, oftentimes it's crazy. We, we make these, we have, we have these fears about making change, but, but, but we forget what it's relative to. I mean, I mean, the, the, what's that phrase? The devil you don't know is scarier than the devil you do or right, something right. like that, right? Like that's crazy. That's a crazy, terrible way to think. Because if you know what you have in front of you and you know that it's not what you want, well, listen, trading it in for something else can only possibly improve your lot. It's, only, it's the only thing you can do. Or, or at least it'll shake things up and you'll have to find something else. But whatever it is, you won't be stuck with this thing that you don't actually want in the first place. So I, yeah, I quit. I quit and I sat in my bedroom for nine months. And I pitched. I just cold pitched. Uh, I just came up with story ideas and I found an editor. This, this went I, for nine months. Yeah, nine months. Uh-huh, nine months. And um, by the end of those nine months, I had a couple pieces. Uh, it won in the Washington Post, got in the Boston Globe, had a couple of pieces, pieces in the Associated Press. W was that enough to kind of keep the excitement up, or did you ever kind of start second guessing yourself along those nine um, months? I, I started second guessing the financial wisdom of what I was doing. Uh, this was not making a lot of money for me, but no, I had proven to myself that I could write for the Washington Post. And I could stay at the Gardner News for 10 years and not have proven mm -hmm. that to myself. And more, more so, I was proving to the Washington Post that I could write for the Washington Post, which is really important. And uh, so after nine months, um, it, was, it was a little financially untenable, and I was also getting very lonely. So I got an offer from a, from a somewhat larger community newspaper, and I took it, and then I just started doing both at the same time. So I would work for that paper, and then I would also freelance. And so I, I would get up early and I would work on a freelance story and then I'd go to the office for like a 2.30 to 10.30 shift and then I would come home and I would freelance some more. And I did that for many years. Until... That is like stereotypical entrepreneur hustle yeah, right there. That's absolutely right. Uh, you need to. Again, you have to go to them and everything that that means. Um, and so I did that over and over and over and over again. Um, I started getting some work at Boston Magazine, uh, which, was a, which was a nice freelance gig. And then I saw some movement after a couple of years at Boston Magazine, which a senior editor person was leaving, a junior person was going to move up. And uh, I was like, this is going to be my job. I'm going to get this job, this junior editor job. I'm going to move into magazines. Um, so I just quit my newspaper job, and I moved to Boston. Um, and I told the editor-in-chief of Boston Magazine that I was ready to, hi ready to be hired. And uh, that was a risk, but it worked out because I had proven myself and I had spent enough time showing these people that I could work at their level. And now here I was literally going to them. I moved to the city and I said, I'm here, I'm ready. And they hired me. And that's what started the journey. What was the journey like from that point to ending up an entrepreneur? And, um, and, and were there poop to gold moments along that path? Yeah. There's always a poop to gold moment. I mean, there's, it's like nonstop poop to gold moments, right? I, I, I mean, I, I don't feel like I'm ever at gold. I feel like, at, I feel like I'm always at poop, you know? Um, because if you're at gold, then you stop, mm -hmm. and um, and if you're poop, then there's somewhere else to go. And also, you're you're just, you're the goalposts keep getting reset, right? right? So I mean, here I am, and I'll, I'll answer your question about the journey. But you know, I mean, here I am as an editor-in-chief, which was a goal of mine, um, and it's extremely satisfying, but I do not wake up every morning thinking, did it. Like, I, that, you know, like I wake up every morning. It doesn't even morning. cross your mind. No, there's so much more to do. So much more to do. 
Um, so I wake up every morning thinking, holy crap, I'm kind of behind. Um, I need to figure out what is available to me and what I'm missing and how I can be smarter. And I think about that every day. Yeah. Um, what, so, what's, I'm going to shift gears sure. just a little bit. What's the huge goal that you're working towards right now? Um, just a little, you know, it's a little abstract because I, it's a little abstract uh, because I don't necessarily need it, um, right? Which is to say, spending a lot of time with entrepreneurs certainly makes you want to be entrepreneurial. Um, but I don't need to do it this second. I don't need to own my own company this second because I, I have a great job and I'm not ready to walk out the door. Uh, and hopefully they're not ready to kick me out the door. <laughs> and so, um, but, but what am I aware of? What I'm very, very aware of right now is that I have a, I have a very high profile position and I have the opportunity to get in front of lots of people and to get very good at being in front of lots of people. So I just earlier this week was speaking to a chamber of commerce event in Kansas. It was a thousand people and I got up there and I frankly killed it. Like I, you know, I mean, just had all these people come up and say it was the best talk they've ever seen. And I love that, but that didn't happen accidentally. That happened because I've spent years Honing. Honing it and thinking about it and like being rough on stage until I got better and, and watching tape of myself and getting better. And why am I doing that? I'm doing it for a couple of reasons. One, because it's, it's, it's a great way to promote mm -hmm. the magazine, right? Like I'm going out and I'm representing the magazine and I talk about entrepreneurship and I talk about the magazine. So that's all good for the thing that I'm doing now. But frankly, it's also good for the thing that I'm gonna do next, which I, I haven't fully defined, but I know I know that in some way, me being able to stand on a stage mm -hmm. or being able to present to people and being really good at it is going to be valuable. I, I have this theory of work, which is called work your next job. The idea is that uh, at each moment, everybody, you, me, uh, everybody listening to this, watching this, has two sets of opportunities in front of them. Opportunity set A, opportunity set B. Opportunity set A are the jobs that are being asked of you. Right? If you're at a job, people are asking you to do a thing, you have tasks, so you're supposed to do them. Mm -hmm. That's opportunity set A. Opportunity set B are all the opportunities that nobody's asking you to do, but that are available to you. And opportunity set B is always more important. So the reason for that is because opportunity set A, if you only focus on A, if you only focus on the things that people are asking you to do, then you are only going to be qualified to do the thing you're already doing. But if you're doing, if you're focusing on opportunity set B, even if you don't know exactly where it's going to go, even if you don't know the ROI on it, what you're doing is you're adding to your skill sets and you're broadening the possible opportunities for the future. And I am obsessed with that. So that's why I do speaking right now. I, that's why I do podcasting right now. That's why I do a whole bunch of other stuff right now. Because what I'm doing is, yeah, yeah, it's helping me now in a way, mm -hmm. right? It amplifies my voice. It makes me some money. It's all nice, cool. But but what I'm really thinking about are these are skills and positionings that are going to be really valuable in some way that I don't know later. So let's do it now. Smart. Once again, it's that entrepreneur hustle. Yeah. Let's step back for a second and talk about the broader industry. Sure. Um, what are some skills that entrepreneurs are going to need in the 2020s that were less important in the 2010s? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I saw, I saw somebody on your LinkedIn ask that, and I, I read it and I was like, huh. You know, the thing is that there are two ways to approach that. There's, there's bro broad skills uh, that, are, that are timeless. Uh, I mean, to me, the thing that is most important for an entrepreneur is the ability to embrace change and to constantly redefine themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's not any different one decade ago as it, as it was one century ago or, or a century from now. That's constant. Um, though, you know, I, you can think about how we engage with technology and how we are um, shaped by it, and you can recognize that there are shifting patterns. For example, a generation ago, it was very valuable to be able to retain information in your head, and now, that's not as valuable because you just don't need it. 
uh, because it's you can find it really easy. You need to retain the search, the key, the you, key search terms. You right? need to be a good pattern matcher, and you need to understand how to find and gather information and put it together quickly. It's a different skill set, and, and the problem that we have when we focus on how technology changes us is that we always preference the old thing, and we think that the new thing is somehow lesser than. So, for example, people will say the, the Atlantic literally put this on their cover. Google makes us stupid. No, it doesn't. Google doesn't make us stupid. Google is just a tool that's representative of a new kind of skill set. Right? So I don't, you know what? I don't need to retain all this information in my head. Doesn't mean I'm stupid. It just means that I literally don't need it now because there's a tool that enables me to find it. What I need is a different skill set, which is the ability to find it and pull it together. So we often will mistake change for failing, and that's incorrect. So uh, I, I, I like th that to me is going to be the thing that I think people are going to need to focus on the most as we think about what comes in the next. 10 years, the next 20 years, there's going to be a lot of change and a lot of new ways that we're going to interact with uh, our world and our technology and our world through our technology. And we will have to resist the gut instinct to say, oh, that means something bad has happened. Oh, that's some kind of failing of ours. Oh, we're just not the kind of people that we used to be. No, that's all ridiculous and wrong. Um, instead, uh, it's just different. But it doesn't mean that it's worse. It's just different. And you know what? It's often different in, the, in a way in which it's actually kind of the same, right? Uh, knowledge base. It's just a different kind of knowledge base. Mm -hmm. um, uh, skill sets. Just different kind of skill sets. And this, by the way, is something that I... I this is the sort of central premise of this podcast that I do called Pessimists Archive, mm -hmm. which is a history show about why people resist new things. So each episode looks at the moment where something new is introduced that today we think of as commonplace, the car, the bicycle, the novel, chess, and uh, I try to understand why it freaked everybody out because this is a recurring thing. I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with this idea of, um, of how things change but also stay the same and how we repeat our fears across time even though they generally mm -hmm. don't actually come true. I was reading a biography about uh, Lewis and Clark, mm -hmm. and it shocked me. I can't remember if it, was, if it was Lewis or Clark, but they were so upset about the domestication of horses mm. because they were just so sure it was softening men. Like, you know, men had been walking, sure. you know, for so many miles, <laughs> right. and, and they thought horses made men weak. Yeah. And, and as I read that, I was like, that's like the exact same thing that you know, we go through with every new technology that Absolutely. comes out. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what's, I mean, what's especially hilarious there is that it also repeated itself when the horse got replaced by the car. That's right. You know, people would, people would stand on the side of the street when an early car came by, late 1800s, and they would yell, get a horse, at the person <laughs> in the car. Right? So the horse had gone from this thing that was softening men to the thing that defined men, and now something else was going to soften uh -huh. us. And we just repeat this over and over again. Jason, where can our listeners follow you? Uh, well, all sorts of places. Um, the the catch-all, if you can remember one thing, is just my name.com, jasonfeifer.com, J-A-S-O-N-F-E-I-F-E-R.com. Um, that has links to everything, all the podcasts, articles, um, blah, blah, blah. But if you're more of an Instagram or Twitter person, at HeyFeifer does well. And, uh, and you know, if you're listening to this podcast right now, I have three of them. Uh, the other ones are Problem Solvers and Hush Money. But, um, but I'll just uh, direct you again to Pessimist Archive because I think that's... Uh, I think that's the one that, that may connect most with the conversation that we're, that we're having now about embracing change. So again, that's Pessimist Archive. It's a history show about why people resist new things. Awesome. Any quick sneak peeks of stuff coming down the, the pipeline for you? Just in general? Um, well, long term, I've been toying with this book based on Pessimist Archive. Uh, and I've had a bunch of people reach out to me about that. Uh, so that's going to be exciting whenever we get there. Um, the next episode is about birthday parties uh, because people people thought birthday parties were a terrible, terrible idea. They were going to make a soft. It was kind of similar. <laughs> they were going to make a soft birthday parties. Um, so um, so that'll be fun. And uh, oh, and and I'm depending on when people listen to this, um, I can't tell you who it is, but I have a very, very cool cover coming for our April issue. And I wrote the cover story and it was a total delight. And I'm going like bananas on writing this story. So I'm, I'm excited for everybody to read that. Jason, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thanks so much for coming on. Hey, well, thank you for being, uh, thank you for including me. And for our listeners, make sure to like, share, and subscribe. And we'll see you on the next one. Thank you to our sponsor, Divi. 
Divi is a business credit card that's made a huge impact on Harmon Brothers. So in the past, we used to just use standard cards. And we'd give them to a few employees and they'd go out and spend money. And then afterwards, we would find out how much they spent. Sometimes they stayed within budgets, other times they didn't. But with Divi, it's a little bit different. We issue those cards to our employees and we can manage before the money is spent exactly what their budget is for any given project. So with Divi, it's different. Divi gives you the controls before the money is spent mm -hmm. instead of just looking at the damage after the fact. The way it works is you issue a card to all your employees. We do it for every single employee, even including our interns. There's no cost. It's each employee gets a card and it's no risk because they can't, they can't spend any money from the card unless we allocate money to them to be able to spend it. So we have full controls and full visibility over who is spending and where the money is going. And so this has made a huge impact on us because now we have much tighter controls on our project budgets and it's um it's a lot safer too yeah at the end of the day it's a lot more secure than sending a whole bunch of employees out with credit cards that you're trying to keep track of <laughs> wait who has the card now and how much has been spent on that that's all happening in real time through the app and our finance team just loves it yeah the finance team loves it we love it because mm -hmm. it gives us peace of mind that the money is actually being controlled and that yeah. there's you know not wild expenditures going on out there. Yeah. Um, and even our project teams love it. You know the the producers and the project managers really appreciate the insights that they get into their project budgets rather than having to wait until after the fact to see what the damage was. So, Divi is a free service that. If you're interested in it for your business, you can check them out at getdivi.com forward slash Harmon Brothers. That's get, G-E-T, divi, D-I-V-V-Y.com forward slash Harmon Brothers.